Hey, welcome back, and I'm Dr. Gary Benicher, and we're in the database class, and we're going to be looking at the first uh, unit, and as a matter of fact, we're going to do an undergraduate review. So we'll probably do 15 weeks of material in about 10 minutes, because that's the limit that was imposed by YouTube. So hang on to your hats, and let's go. Okay, this is about page 7 of the Unit 1 notes for the undergraduate review. I don't claim this is going to be a comprehensive review. All I want to do is make sure that you're aware of some of the assumptions I have in terms of what you've had in your undergraduate database class. Now if you get to this page and you scroll down, you'll see this sign here that shows uh, kind of arrows going off in all different directions and a couple words for different types of databases. Now the point here is that some of the things that we'll be learning in this semester might apply to let's say an Oracle database but they may or may not necessarily apply to a MySQL database so you have to be very careful that if let's say in the event you're working on a job that you pay attention to the manuals and even in the even when we talk about let's say for Oracle uh, version 11 in the future it might be version 13 or 14 and you still they might have done away with certain features or added new features so you want to be really careful that uh, changes do occur in databases obviously. Now if we scroll down the introduction here describes a database, basically a collection of files, files, a collection of records and so forth and we describe a database instance is a set of background processes and threads uh, and a shared memory area. Now when you go through the notes and you see these definitions pay very careful attention to those because that is something I'm expecting to you know expecting you to know quite well. If we scroll down here what we see is a kind of a description of either a relation table or file it goes by a variety of names then the rows correspond to records um, or tuples and the columns are usually described as fields, columns or attributes. I've heard it done quite a few ways. Now when we talk about the number of rows here, we're talking about the cardinality and if we talk about the number of columns, we might say uh, the degree. So this has a degree of 3 and 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 6, cardinality of 6. Also the arity is used more frequently than the word degree to refer to the column. So this little table has an arity of 3. Now we'll see the word cardinality in a different context quite shortly, but just be aware that it has uh, multiple meanings. Okay, when we talk about records, we need to have a way of identifying it. And probably as you know, a record is identified with a key. And a key is basically one or more attributes used to uniquely identify a tuple and relation. <clears throat> now it's important, um, if, if it's more than Two, two or more attributes, we call that a composite key. Now, there are two terms that are very important, especially in the next couple of weeks, in terms of types of keys. There is what's called a super key and a candidate key. Notice terms that I think are extremely important I've highlighted in yellow. So, what exactly is a super key? Well, you know what a key is. Like here we have student, we have social security number. So the social can identify the student. Basically when we take a key and we add one or more attributes and kind of pad it with additional attributes, that is known as a super key. So we could have social, social last name, social security number and street, social city, social state, social zip. We could actually use all the attributes for identifying, uh, for creating a super key. So if there's a key within the super key, or basically a super key contains a key. Now obviously if we're working with social security number and name we really don't need last name and this introduces the idea of a candidate key. Now the definition here is you can read it if no the key is a candidate key if no proper subset of that key is a super key what that means is it's in the, its leanest form so if you get rid of last name, social security number would indeed be a key. So these two together uh, are a super key because they contain the key SSN, but it's not a candidate key because we can eliminate one of the attributes and still have a key left over. 
Now, let's say, well, we'll talk more about that. Let's say we have, uh, let's say car, and we have license number and state. Let's, instead of having VIN as the key, let's assume it was license number and state. Now, with a car, um, you, you obviously, if you just knew the state like Texas, you couldn't identify the car. If you had a license number, well, the same license number might be in multiple states. So you need both attributes here. So this would be an example of a candidate key. Now, it's, it's also a composite key because it's made of two or more attributes. And it's a super key because it contains a key. Okay? So candidate key is a key in its leanest, meanest form. Super key informally you can think of as a key where we've added one or more additional attributes uh, to that original key. Now, at times we want to talk about a foreign key. And here we have a student SSN. And let's say we have a car with a vehicle identification number. Well, we might say which student owns which car. So we might put the VIN attribute in student so that the uh, student, we say, okay, uh, John Smith owns the uh, uh, Chevrolet uh, Camaro. So that would be a way to refer back to that. Okay. So a foreign key is an attribute or a set of attributes with one within one relation whose values match one of the primary keys uh, of some, but not necessarily different relation. This could be a recursive thing like employee, and you might have who's my boss, and and so even with an employee table, you might have a supervisor foreign key which refers back to the social security number. Okay. Now this part here is who decides what the primary key is. I'll let you read that on your own. If we go down a page, we come to conceptual database design. Or, I'd imagine you've known it as ER, or Entity Relation Model. One of the things that we want to do is be uh, able to represent at a very high level what's going on within the database before we do the actual design. We might come up with this, show this to the uh, senior management who's not technical, and they in turn would say, yeah, this fits and this doesn't fit. So we have things, objects, which are known as entities, and we have uh, uh, particular properties of those entities, which we call attributes. And when we describe uh, the way how one object relates to another, we talk about relationships. So if we have a requirements documents, then typically the nouns in the document com correspond to entities and the verbs correspond to relationships. Now here I have a little example and we see that a, there's a faculty object and a student or faculty entity, student entity, corresponding uh, attributes for faculty and attributes for student and how are these two related is faculty teaches students. The M and the N correspond to the cardinality, that is, many faculty might teach one student, and one student might be taught by many students. Okay, so there's another usage of the word cardinality there. We'll talk more detail about that in the next couple weeks. Now, this is an example of different types of cardinality. We see one-to-one. -one. This little oval represents some object. This oval represents another object, and little dots correspond to instances. So it might be different faculty members and distant, different students. Okay, so it's clear that's one to one. This is one to many because there uh, we see this one matching with many instances there. This is many matching to one. And here we have one to many, many to one, so we call that a many to many. And that's important to know when we do uh, database design, the cardinality between the different entities.